Africa is rising, they say. But Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. How then do we harness Africa's wealthy people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one. Hello Nigeria, hello Africa and the rest of the world. You are welcome to the very first episode of the talk show edition of Social Conscience with NASA, SCW, and it's a bit of a mouthful. I am your host, NASA, your host with the most and the voice of social justice. So I'm passionately advocating matters that impact humanity. It's such a dream for me to be here, guys, to be doing this. It's like birthing a baby um, social Conscience with NASA is an expression of my passion and my purpose to impact people positively. And the goal for me is to inspire, to inform, to enlighten and ultimately advocate positive social change that will impact socioeconomic development. But I'm sure you're wondering how it all started. For me, and as wearing my consultant hat, I need to give a bit of context to this, right? So it was in the early hours of March 25, 2020, just in the wake of the COVID pandemic. And the government was beginning to encourage, you know, shutdowns and social distancing, etc. And I was having this conversation with a friend of mine who was going to work. And I, this was when I was already working from home. And I couldn't understand it because I thought, you know what, aren't we all supposed to be acting responsibly? Why are these businesses insisting for people to come to work, right? So I, I got a bit bothered and a bit restless about it. And I was talking to another friend who then says, you know what, why don't you share your views publicly? Why don't you write about this? I'm like, really? Why am I writing about it? Like, isn't this what everybody is talking about? But I decided to take that leap of faith and I started to write. And that's how social conscience the article with NASA was birthed, right? And so again, it was my restlessness that pushed me to start to write and I wanted to share my views publicly. But you see, social conscience for me is more than writing and I'm bringing it to radio because it's an advocacy platform for me to then pursue my passion to be a catalyst for change in society, to drive positive social change. So the focus will be on you know, the mega trends and development issues that impact our society and how we can harness those or curb them by leveraging insights from various sources. So the theme for this very first episode or this month actually is around the youth, given that Africa has a large youth population and the specific topic on the back of Nigeria's 60th independence. In fact, happy independence, Nigeria, which was yesterday the topic is Nigeria 60 years later, the youth and the promise of tomorrow. And this topic came to mind because I'm thinking, you know, Nigeria is 60. When I was young, I remember, you know, different songs around we, the youth are the future leaders, we're the leaders of tomorrow. And I look around me and I'm thinking, well, uh, you know, where are the young leaders, right? So Nigeria is one of Africa's, you know, countries and celebrating its 60th independence anniversary. You want to ask if it's taking stock of all it's been doing. You know, we have a youth population with an average age of about 18 or so. And so what are we doing with that huge population? What's Nigeria going to do with its youth? Is this still a promise in futility? Is this going to actually ever materialize? Apparently, a substantial number of African countries today are actually only between 43 to 60 years old post-independence. And the average age of the leaders in African countries is about 80. And the average age of the population in Africa is 19. So, again, this question, are the youth really the leaders of tomorrow? Looking at these statistics that we have, because so far they haven't been. And if they have, they are very few and far between. 
So these are things that play in my mind. These are things I want to discuss in social conscience. Now, I'll have someone to join me in a few minutes to share his perspectives on the topic. And it's someone whom I respect immensely. He's a young leader in Nigeria's public sector who is passionate about youth empowerment. But before I engage the special guest of mine, uh, please stay with me and we'll take a quick break. We are the wind in the sails of your business. We are your compass. Chart your course towards your targets. Africa Business Radio. Towards a profitable... Oh, this feels like the final football match between two soccer warriors. Oh my God. Can somebody please tell me what the African formation is? Oh, oh, it's 442. Amazing. Cool stuff. That's just super amazing, isn't it? Africa Business Radio is doing 442 on the news with 40% Nigerian stories, 40% African stories, and 20% global stories. Now that's what I call a homegrown hot drinking goal. Africa is rising, they say, but Africa must rise with its people. There is no Africa without its people. How then do we harness Africa's wealthy people through social change and development? Social Conscience with NASA commits to Aspiration 6 of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the Global Development Goals. We advocate social change and development that will inspire the transformation that keeps Africa rising. Join us every week at 6.30 p.m. GMT plus one. Welcome back, and I hope you're looking forward to this next segment as much as I am. The topic remains Nigeria 60 years later, the youth and the promise of tomorrow. To share his perspectives on the topic is none other than Akintunde Oyebodi, an economist and finance professional with over two decades of experience working in various industries within the private sector. His foray into public service formally started in 2015 when he joined the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, LSETF, as its pioneer executive secretary slash CEO, during which he achieved great feats in driving the development of MSMEs as a catalyst to tackle youth unemployment. In 2019, he voluntarily left his role and joined the Ekiti State Government as Special Advisor and Director General of the Ekiti State Development and Investment Promotion Agency. Until recently, he led the state's drive to attract domestic and international investment. About a couple of months ago, Aki was appointed Commissioner of Finance and Economic Development for Ikiti State Government. Welcome, Aki, and thank you for honoring my invitation as the first ever guest on the show. It must be a sign of great things to come. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Yay. Aki, I know you're a very busy person and I, I, you don't know how grateful I am to have you here. I know I've been trying to reach you endlessly today, but I appreciate it. I thank you for creating time. And I also know that, you know, the topic we're discussing today is something that you're passionate about, especially, you know, I've known you since my banking days and I remember how you used to do blogs on Why Niger and all of that. So I thought you were the perfect person to have this discussion with and to open the show with. So I'll jump right into it. Um, I started with, with uh, so the topic again to remind you is Nigeria 60 years later, you know, the youth are this, you know, are they, is there still a promise of them being the future leaders? And the reason I ask is if you look at the mean age of, you know, 10 of Africa's oldest leaders, it's about 80 in comparison with the average age distribution of the, on the continent, which is about 19, right? And so if you look at the more developed countries, um, the average age is about 52. 
What does this mean for the growing youth population that are promised future leadership in Africa? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off being a bit contrarian okay. on this one. Um, so we usually, you know, just use, in my opinion, lazy average age comparisons, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. where you have lots of, lots of, um, young families, etc., that age distribution is already skewed by how kids are. Okay. So the first thing is to say, look, I I think um, that there's definitely green shoots. I don't think it's perfect, but I definitely think that we're moving in the right direction. Africa generally has struggled with giving young people opportunities. Uh, There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that Nigeria has done a better job of it than most, right? Okay. And youth, by definition, does not necessarily mean competence right i mean we've had especially under the military rule we've had governors in their early 30s we've had a president at 29 if i'm not mistaken mm-hmm. um you know i mean the current president was head of state at maybe 40 or something like that you know? right um so i mean again the point is that at, at the time these guys led the country where they were they prepared you know, were they ready for 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 governance? Mm-hmm. Were they ready for leading millions of people? Right. Um, I mean, the the outcomes today suggest probably not. So, I think for me, the fundamental thing is first understanding how do we prepare young people for leadership. It's not really Fantastic. like oh, we must give people the opportunity, you know, but how do we prepare them for that opportunity? In today's Nigeria, I mean, we've had governors today. I mean, Governor Bello in Kogi is in his early 40s. Correct. You know, my own principal, I, I always say to him, you know, was governor in his early to mid 40s. You mm-hmm. know, so um, we've not, we've had ministers like Emeka Chike Lu and Frank Nweke, yeah. who have, I mean, Donald Duke was governor at in his 30s. You That's know, so true. I don't think that age has necessarily been a barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for many people to and it's it's not I mean it's at what age and it's what what have you done to sort of earn your earn at the table got it so so I think that Nigeria has done a fairly decent job in the number of young people who have been in positions of leadership mm-hmm. um, but for me the, the the question is have we been deliberate about building a pool of leaders mm-hmm. you know have we been deliberate about you know when you 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 know in in banking for example yeah. You know, someone identifies you as a high performer, Correct. you know, mm-hmm. or a high potential, you know, uh, talent. You, you get put in a specific talent pool, right? Yeah. You get asked to, you get asked to work in different divisions of the institution. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you probably get a better bonus than your peers. You feel special in some way. You know, you feel like you're being prepared for something. And that automatically starts to throw some responsibility on you, right? That you have to deliver on that potential. Um, I don't know that many there are many government initiatives that do things like this. You know, I like the I like the uh, the fellowship, for example, that the Kaduna State Government runs. Yeah, they bring um, You know, you know, yes. and and for me, you know, those are the kind of things that start to generate you know a pipeline of leaders. Of leaders. Um, you know, but also to see that, and one of the things I always say is, as a young person, not me now. But for young people, they should be asking the question that who, which kind of leaders have shown a propensity for developing young people, for mm-hmm. developing a talent pipeline? Yeah. And how do, how do we reward and encourage these kinds of people? You know, because if we don't make it a, a critical discussion at, at the ballot box, Right, then it will never, it will never, it will never be, it will never be prioritized. It's also the same thing why, and I know that's not what we're discussing, mm-hmm. but I always say that for a society that has such a high number of female voters, yes. it is critical that women actually say, "We are not going to vote for you if we are not clear that you are very keen on issues that ensure that gender you. equality and, and and protect and protect women." Right, so you know it's. Because with, 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 with politicians, with politics, yeah. which is the tool for governance, mm-hmm. the only currency that you understand in politics is the ballot box. True. Sure. Right? So, uh, if you don't make it an issue at the ballot box, then it doesn't make a sense. Fantastic. Okay, so you say, I, I like everything you said. It sort of aligns with a lot of the thoughts I've been having. And um, 
so my next question will tie into when you talk about having a seat at the table. So I'm reading this Brookings Institution yep. publication in 2018 around leadership in Africa. And there was a statement that I took there, paraphrased, you know, it says the youth should prioritize being formally represented in decision making processes and institution, having a seat at the table instead of being on the menu. And so you, for me, are one of those people who has taken that leap to be off the menu and to take a seat at the table and you've been deliberate about it. So um, why did you make this decision to go off the menu? You know, you voluntarily left LSETF to join a state government. And I know, again, and so when you talk about, um, you know, demonstrating that capability, it doesn't start in a day. It's throughout your work. Like, so I know even when you were working... Um, in the bank and everything, how, how, um, how deliberate you were about that and in terms of performance. So it's not something that you, you wake up to and say, well, I'd like to be a leader. You, you should have sort of demonstrated that, um, capacity over time. So, um, yeah. So my question is, you know, what made you take that decision to leave the menu and to sit on the table? I mean, I think I know the answer, but I think that it'll be good to also just sort of share what drove you to my listeners. I mean, I will uh, shamelessly borrow the title of uh, Nasser Al Rufai's autobiography okay. and say that, you know, I was also, and I am also an accidental public servant. Um, because as you know, my career was in finance primarily and I enjoyed banking. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed making money for myself <laughs> and other people. Mm -hmm. And when it was time you know, in 2015, right. uh, I then, I then took a very public, I'd, I'd always been partisan. I'd always had a membership card of the political party, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't something that I fronted, right? It was something that I did and it was a personal decision and I kept in my back pocket. Yeah. Um, but, in, but in 2015, I became very frontal about it. Um, and I, I then started to work a lot more actively. I'd worked on the campaign. So, uh, in 2011, I had volunteered for Nobu Ribadu's campaign uh, mm -hmm. when he ran for president with Fola Diola. And I volunteered because those were two people that I, you know, thought uh, shared the values of of leadership that I wanted to see. You know, Mr. Right. Diola, seasoned banker, mm -hmm. everything he touched turned to gold. Right. Um, I, and I, I thought that this, these are the kinds of people that should be in control of our country. Mm. Um, so I worked actively for him. Uh, before then, in 2010, I had, you know, I was very excited to have Dr. Fahemi, uh become governor of Ikiti State because I felt it was very good for someone like me, I, you know, uh, or someone like us, you know, who mm -hmm. had a, a very strong intellectual sense of of the world, um, um, who was, you know, what you could say was, you know, had the right levels of exposure, yeah. you know, was well educated. Um, and understood what the issues were, so that for people like that to run for me was a great thing. It was it was noble. So I supported him. I supported the uh, Ribadu Adiola campaign. But in 2015, I became more open about my 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 political uh, activities, mm -hmm. and and I, I think that it was also a recognition that more of us needed to jump into the ring. Right. Um, and and that at the end of the day. You know, uh, we either go, we are either going to shape our future or have it shaped for us. So I like to I tell people that look, if I if if I'm lucky, right, I have now lived forty plus years, mm -hmm. right. So if you live to eighty, I think you can you can thank God that He's giving you a lot of time. Correct. Right. Yeah. So so I I always say to myself that you know this is almost like you now have to do a half term assessment, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and say. How do you influence, how do you spend hopefully the next two decades, you know, to influence the kind of society you want to see? Mm. So I certainly don't, I certainly do not want to be uh, an active public servant or actively working in improving society post, you know, 60. Mm -hmm. That's a period where you want to relax and retire Absolutely. and look back with fond memories of, of what you've done. So... I, I kind of take my life in those kind of buckets, right? And I thought that, you know, my, my 35 to 50 period was like my most active period ever. It's mm -hmm. when I feel that you have the right skill. So you've worked now for maybe 10 plus years. You have skill, experience, and mo most importantly, you have energy. 
Yeah. Right? So I felt that this is a period where your skill, your experience, and your energy can be put to use, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to the betterment of society. So, so that's what sort of drove me into public service. That, look, we've got to be, we've got to be deliberate about spending our best years uh, in the service of, of our people. If you don't do it, no one is going to do it. Somebody has got to do the job. Um, right. And so, I mean, that, that was my view. And I then cultivated, I was lucky, some of the networks I have mm-hmm. were networks that I inherited. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I actually went and did some work. You know, I would close from work and go and work for the Oshibajo, uh, Buhari Oshibajo campaign office. You know, I'd leave work at night, go and work for Governor Ambode's campaign. Mm-hmm. You know, these were things that were pro bono assignments, but you right. leave your job at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. You go and take on another job that you do till one in the morning, wow. and you got to be back at work at eight, right? So, yeah. so it did, it did, it did take, take it, it, it takes a toll on mm-hmm. you. But, but, but like I say, you know, all of these things are temporary, um, and they're for the greater good. So you've got to be able to, you've got to go and put in the work, right? Either you are organizing, either you are providing some support, mm-hmm. either you are helping with mm-hmm. policy, you know, or you are fundraising. You've got to know what your skill is. And offer that skill to the political network. Um, and of course, when you get an opportunity, you've got to grab it with both hands, right? So yeah. even when Governor Mbode asked me to join his administration to run the Employment Trust Fund, I was initially skeptical. I, you know, I asked for some time to think about it. Uh, but ultimately, he, I always say he blackmailed me by saying, <laughs> you know, you, you, you see all these fancy things, you see all these things that we should be doing. How now I give you an opportunity to, to do it. And you, and you say to me, <laughs> I can find you someone else. Like if I, I if I wanted someone else, I'd have found them myself. You know? So um, at that point, I had to say to him, "Okay, well, it does look like you know I'm not willing to walk the talk, so we'll take the job." Um, but again, you know, that's for me the, the main thing that that pushed me, and mm-hmm. and I, I don't regret it. But but just to summarize and just to close that on that point, yeah. you know, what I always say that the, being deliberate about it is also knowing that you've got one chance, you've got to make it count. Um, and that you carry the weight of a generation on your shoulders. Wow. Uh, people are very keen and they're, they're very happy to point out youngish people yeah. who have made a mockery of governance. Yeah. Um, and they will use that as, as a reason why youth or age should not be a factor in leadership uh, discussions. So when you get into a leadership role as a youngish person, mm-hmm. it's important to make it count, you know, because you recognize that what you want to be is not for you to gain any accolades for yourself. But it's for, if you can be an example that other young people can say, hey, here this goes person. that person. Absolutely. You know, he did this job and did it very well. So why can't I do the same thing? You know, um, and there are many people who, Dr. Fayemi, for example, mm-hmm. uh, Governor El Rufai, for example, yeah. uh, Go- Governor Duke, for example. There are quite a number of examples of people who got into public service relatively young and have gone on to have, you know, a distinguished career in, in government. Wow. Thank you, Akin. So, you know what? I mean, and what, what I hear you say is, in a nutshell, pay it forward and being deliberate, you, you just have to understand that you've got to do the time as well. So it's not just going to fall on your laps. In a, so I call, so a lot, you hear a lot of people saying that the youth are, you know, they have that sense of entitlement. And so maybe the public service is just not attractive, but they want to see this change. So you, you've got to decide, like, what is it that you want to do and how do you want to contribute to that? And it's interesting to hear you say when, um, Governor Amber, they said to you, you know, you say all these fancy things. So how about you put, you, sort of put your money where your mouth is and back your, your talk with action. And that's what you've been doing so far. Um, so, my next question is around um, accountable leadership. And again, this is from this Brookings Institution publication that I was reading, where it was sort of alluding to the fact that the leadership in Africa, for, for success to, well, for Africa to be transformed successfully, mm-hmm. it needs accountable leadership. And when I'm thinking accountability... Yes. Are the Nigerian youth poised to take the reins of leadership? And the reason I say this is, I just feel like everybody just wants everything to happen in a heartbeat. They don't want to put in the time like you've done. So if someone will be thinking, are you serious? I'll go to work and then go and do some extra hours to 1 a.m. I don't, whose father died? Like, do you understand? So 
um, it's one thing for us to say we want to be leaders of tomorrow, but are we even ready? Or are, I'm, I'm saying, are we? I'm, I'm young as well. I think are the Nigerian youth ready? Are they even poised to take the reins of leadership? That's the one question. Number two, you had said that um, we should also look for leaders that will drive youth development. I think that you will be that kind of leader. You know what? would you do practically to make that happen so you made uh, reference to the the fellowship program in i think kaduna state you know so how would you also contribute to that I mean, you you have been doing stuff so far but more practically in terms of getting young people into the public sector or public service if you like okay i think that's a very good question um i mean i i'd like to say that these things we for me personally um i i i feel ultimately a calling to constantly speak uh, mentor coach nudge you know people who have similar or even bigger aspirations to mine mm. um I, I will I commit quite a bit of my time to public speaking okay. uh, with young people especially right. because I also I've also benefited from from those kinds I remember the first time I listened to Dr. Suleiman speak mm-hmm. um, was when I was in undergrad and he can't even remember that he can't remember even coming to the University of Lagos then but after listening to him speak I made a significant decision yeah. um, that I believe has even led me to where I am today uh, and it struck me, I've, I've mentioned this to him, I think, once, and he couldn't remember, hmm. right? And it struck me, that, that, that experience struck me so much that this man gave so freely something that probably changed my life. Yeah. And he didn't even realize what he was doing. He hmm. can't even remember that discussion. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder how many people he's done that for. And they don't, he doesn't even you know? realize. So <laughs> just by showing up, just by showing up and speaking to young people, sometimes in close, intimate sessions of maybe two, three, four, five people, yeah. sometimes in bigger sessions of hundreds of people, uh, you never really quite know how many other careers you're shaping. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that for me is the first thing I'm very deliberate about. Um, I mean, I, I think at some point in my career, it will obviously be the right time to start to be a bit more deliberate about grooming, you know, Instead of leaders where we can share in a structured manner, right. you know, some of the principles I think have worked for me and might work for them. Uh, but I always try to be mindful of these foundations, etc., and all these kind of <laughs> things because it, sometimes people think, sometimes think things they think it's a it. way of saying you want to whitewash or you want to <laughs> run for one office or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, but, but but I think that for me, it's also providing opportunities for people who who will come after me. Um, and I've, I've been, I've been, I've been a beneficiary of people trusting me all through my career. Mm-hmm. From the beginning, when, when, uh, Professor Albert Alos, mm-hmm. you know, trusted me to be his research assistant, okay. even though I missed Lagos my first Business interview school? with him for the mm-hmm. reason I can't. Yeah, at Lagos <laughs> Business School. I mean, I've been trusted by many people to doing Salami, for example, trusting me, despite being very troublesome to be his research assistant <laughs> and later technical assistant. Uh, in 2015 when he was vice chairman of the APC transition committee mm-hmm. you know I've had different types of people just trust me you know Ladi Balogo and Tolak Badamosi at FCMB yeah. you know Taze, Taze Butendag um, at yes, Stambik IBTC Bayer Adesina at Stambik mm-hmm. IBTC mm-hmm. uh, Gonan Bode at Lagos State Government I mean the guys looked at me and they, they said is this the guy we're going to give 25 billion naira to you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> It must come and, with some you know, the trust. Trusted, uh-huh. You know, the governor trusted me. Uh, today, you know, doc, Dr. Fahemi, uh has entrusted the Ministry of Finance in my, in my, in my care. Mm-hmm. You know, so again, you know, these things, you know, I, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be lying if I said that these things aren't the result of people trusting you. It's not really what you done. That's because true. giving you the job, you know, your, your track record is, yes, it's good, but it's really not a predictor of what you'll do in the future. You know, so it's people trusting you that hey we think there's something about this person that makes him or her the right person to do this job Mm -hmm. so i also try to i make sure that i also trust younger people yeah you know with significant responsibility um and i can attest to that Mm -hmm. thank you very much (laughs) you know 
and, 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 and I think I let them make their mistakes, you know, mm-hmm. and I've always been clear about it that, you know, in the teams that I'll lead, you know, I'll always have younger people within those teams, mm-hmm. whether it's at Stambik, whether it's at LSETF, uh, whether it's within the Akiti state government, you know, I'll stay true to that philosophy because that philosophy that has gotten me to this point. Uh, so you mustn't, you mustn't take, you mustn't remove the ladder when you, uh, the ladder you've used to get up. You know? mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Um, what you should, what you should try to do is provide a, a stable and longer ladder Absolutely. for other people to also climb. Wow, fantastic! So again, just to bring that together, the key thing here is trust. You know, people need to trust you to be able to deliver and. It's also to then extend that hand to other people and then we continue to to drive that sort of growth or bring other people on board. Okay, okay so um, we, we're supposed to have questions from, from the audience. I'm not sure if there are any just yet, but we'll soon finish this segment. But before we finish, there's one more question I just wanted to ask and I've heard everything you've said. But to your mind, what would you say or from what you know, what would you say at the key obstacles to youth leadership in Nigeria from both sides now from the individuals themselves and I think you must have touched on it but just to sort of summarize it maybe the, to list a couple of things what are the key obstacles to, to youth leadership I have my my opinion and one is the anyhowness and I just don't see you know I just don't know how that's going to be um, corrected I, it just looks like it gets worse over time and then all other things, that sense of entitlement. And also from the public sector side, the um, complaint is it's not attractive enough. And, you know, it's not as nice as working in the public sector. I mean, private sector is not as structured, all of those sort of things. So what what, what are your views? Um, I mean, I think first up, I, I think that people make government out to be to be unglamorous, right? Well, and I think well, I mean, I, I don't, it's not not glamorous, but you know, it's also just not private sector, and you know, so, so you, you be on both sides. No, mean, no, no. So there, there are ways and there are ways and means of bridging some of these gaps. Okay. For example, uh, we've seen situations where it's not ideal mm-hmm. but we've seen situations where the development partners will sometimes okay. you know cover some of the costs okay. right, of engaging uh, what you might call you know uh, expensive talent um, and ensure that these people at least don't get a, they don't suffer a loss of revenue mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they want to participate in public service right yeah so that's that's something that I've seen uh, work fairly well, right? Um, and it's helped uh, people I know yeah. who economically or financially could not afford to take a drop in income, uh, you know, just at least build a career in public service. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that's one. I've also seen um, situations, and honestly, you know, sometimes your stint in public service actually gives you a significant platform to earn much more salary or much more in your in future, right? Where if you've done a fantastic job in in a state or in the federal government, uh, then your next job is probably a government advisory role yes. with you know a Fortune 500 company. Hmm. Um, because remember, those people also, while they want to hire some what you might call politically exposed people, right. they also want people whose personal brands don't diminish their own okay so Aki is talking about you know um basically the obstacles to youth leadership and some of the opportunities that actually exist within the public service that a lot of people don't actually realize and see it as the not so glamorous sector um, area to work in he shared a lot of views that sort of align with what I'm thinking as well with respect to leadership and young people. And so for me, my sort of closing remark following my conversation with Aki is that, of course, dear young African, if you want to demonstrate to your country and continent that you are the leader of tomorrow, then you must begin to show accountability in your personal circles and smaller constituents. So you want to move from the menu to the table. It's not enough to be young 
And it's not about age, as Akin has mentioned. It's about competency. So you may have the age, but not even have the necessary skills or even the passion to lead, right? So what's important is your intentionality, your accountability, and um, being innovative. So ladies and gentlemen, as we focus on the youth this month, I'd like for you to watch out for another insightful and action-provoking episode of Social Conscience with NASA. Same time, same station, next week. Thank you for staying with me and I am yours conscientiously. Listening to Africa Business Radio, where you get up to date insights on the Africa business landscape. Log on to www.africabusinessradio.com. Your favorite shows are available on podcasts. Download them on our website and mobile app. Africa Business Radio, towards a profitable Africa. We are the wind in the sails of your business. We are your compass. Chart your course towards your targets. Africa Business Radio. Towards a profitable Africa. Oh, this feels like the final football match between two soccer warriors. Oh my God. Can somebody please tell me what the African formation is? Oh, oh, it's 442. Amazing. Cool stuff. That's just super amazing, isn't it? Africa Business Radio is doing 442 on the news with 40% Nigerian stories, 40% African stories, and 20% global stories. Now that's what I call a homegrown hot drinking goal. Go, 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 go.